Uh, hello everyone, my name is Melios Michael. I am uh, the presenter for today's session on the International GCSE Mathematics Module 1. I'm one of the credible specialists uh, in the UK, as well as a trainer for the International GCSE and A-Level Mathematics for Pearson. I'm also a deputy head teacher at uh, a school in Birmingham in the UK. Uh, it's the King Edward School uh, here. This uh, this is currently our half term, which is why I've um, also chosen to to deliver the sessions to you today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today as and giving us this time. Before I start talking, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you are all in the right session. So this is an introductory session. Um, they'll it, it consists of two modules. The this is more to present the qualification, understand the assessments. I'll explain the, the objectives um, as well as the agenda for today in a few minutes. Um, it, with regards to the examinations and an insight to uh, the examination, the recent examinations, as well as um, an update or any analysis of those, that is a different session. Um, I'm happy to take questions and pass to the team and they can get back to you. I'll, I'll share more of this information later on or towards the end of the session. Um, however, just so that you understand that throughout this module uh, and the second module, it's more about understanding the qualification, the expectations, how uh, we as Pearson have put the qualification together, how you can take this information and as you teach, um, you then um, basically are aware of, of, of what key principles, uh, especially with the assessment objectives, are important to address throughout your teaching um, so that your students um, are well prepared for the exams when they sit them. So um, with that, I'll start with the, um, I'm, I'm hoping everyone can see my shared screen here. Um, so the agenda for today, it's basically three sessions uh, within this module. Uh, the getting ready for delivery, um, when we talk about the specification and the content of it. Then we will see the assessment objectives, where we'll look at the assessment for both specifications. Um, there will be a reference to the modular one as well. However, again, there's a separate um, session for that, where you can go a bit deeper within that and explore it and, and see the difference. But I'll mention, I'll refer to this throughout the session today. And then finally, the support of the PSN office. Um, in a previous session, some of you or some of your colleagues uh, might have mentioned a few resources that Pearson, they would have liked Pearson to create. Some of them have been updated uh, and have been either shared on the qualification side or the Emporium side. And again, um, some of them are in progress. And I will also take some ideas of how we can help you deliver this. So um, like with the... Um, the British uh, version of this, the, the, the main GCSE and the A-level here, um, there's a lot of a plethora of resources which you can use um, for the qualifications of this, but some colleagues in the past have asked if we can tailor them with the past papers um, of the International GCSE. So we will, we're will we currently uh, working on that. Um, and again, I'm happy to take any feedback from that and pass to the team as well. Um, and that's basically the key areas that we'll have for today's module. Now, between the two modules, uh, module one is a bit more informative. Module two is more interactive. So if you have, I'm, I'm sure because the resources have been only shared to you this morning, um, it's difficult to have them in writing on the actual questions because we'll dive into specific questions, look at their different objectives, do a bit of maths next time as well, um, share some ideas and discuss about how we should be teaching or addressing this. Um, some of the comments I'll be making are from my own practice as well and my experience, so not necessarily uh, a must do. Uh, and I'm also happy uh, for colleagues here, anyone who's who's um, attended to then share their ideas um, of how they would teach or what their concerns are. Uh, any typical misconceptions that students usually have. Um, so that would be great to then share with us. Now, as I said, this will be more interactive in the second module because of all the information that I'm passing in this first one here. Um, the you can communicate throughout and I'll be monitoring the chat. I have the second screen here, which is why I keep looking on the other side. So apologies if I'm not always looking towards the camera. Um, I've got the chat on the other screen there. So if you do pose any questions, there'll be moments where I look that I look at towards the chat. If uh, at any point uh, you'd like, uh, there'll be uh, there'll be opportunities where you can unmute yourselves and ask me directly if you don't if you prefer to explain something and verbally instead. 
Um, I have the Q and A off because it's too it's too difficult for me to look at the chat, look at the um slides and the Q and A. So please put all the questions on the chat here. Um, you can send it to everyone and have a discussion. There will be a discussion points as well throughout the two modules. Um, and at any point, if anyone has an interactive screen or you have one and you want to join with that the next time, so you can annotate something on the screen as well, um, feel free to, I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up that if you do have a tablet or and want to do annotations on our screen so we can discuss that, that's something that I'm, I'm uh, in favor of for the next um, module. At this, so to move on from here, so the objectives then for today, you can see them on the screen. So identify how the qualifications are devised, review the content of the qualification, explore how to plan the course and the lessons, understand the assessment of the qualifications, um, and how to prepare for the students, identify the support available from Pearson, and then also creating this network and sharing ideas between teachers. So again, we have different people from different locations joining in. It's an opportunity to share and discuss um, the different needs from the, the experiences of everyone who's attended today. With that in mind, I'd, again, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Pearson. Um, they have asked me, if you've heard of this before, uh, apologies, but they always ask me to reintroduce Pearson and just to emphasize of the work they do. Um, so I will, pardon, give me one second, here we go. So within this one here, you can see we are the UK's largest awarding organization, a uh, great heritage stretching over 150 years ago um, back. Um, we do mark um, and provide qualifications to over 3.5 million students a year. And we work alongside six and a half, six, 1,500 schools, colleges, and employers globally. And you can see actually the markings 10 million actual exam scripts, and we operate in 70 countries. And some of you of them are represented today um, looking at where everyone has joined. So again, welcome to today's session. Now, so the first part one was getting ready for the delivery of the qualification. Now, if you have downloaded, there was a wee transfer. If you've joined later on, please go scroll back and we can also reshare the link as well. Um, within that, you will find the specification. So there's a folder, which I'll, I'll show you right now. Um, and within the folder, um, it's the one I'm, I'm showing on the screen. You've got the delegate booklet, which will be utilized more in the second one that will do one of the activities today, but uh, it's taking feedback from a previous session. People prefer to have it either on an interactive one and, and annotate or printed and, and, and written upon. So again, um, I, I do recommend you have a look at that uh, later on. Uh, we then have the specifications, so I'll make reference and we'll utilize them in the next session, especially the um, specification A linear and specification B. Um, the modular one I won't be, be I'll only refer to. What you'll also see in there is an Excel file, which I'll also show on the screen. Um, so if I drag this to the other screen here, sorry. Here we go. So within that, they've done a mapping document. So you can then see as well um, how the linear uh, is mapped against the modular and vice versa. So you can see where and how different topics are, are being taught. Uh, so that's something that you might want to have a look and might find it useful if you do choose to use that specification instead. Um, and then there's benefit and drawbacks for each one, depending on the students, the caliber of students you have. Um, as well as the experience and how big your team is uh, within uh, your departments. So again, it's something to be aware of. Some training might be required. Um, if in my current school, I've got quite a lot of able, very able students I have to stretch and challenge. So when I refer to qualifications, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that as well. My previous school, um, a different context of a school. So that, at that point, um, I had to make sure that there is quite a variety of abilities. Um, so in that case, um, different specifications uh, would work for my school uh, in that um, within, you've got the specification, which is the main document at, um, to teach the course, and that's the one that I was um, showing you a few minutes ago. 
Um, that's the one that the senior examiners need to write papers for uh, and the centers need to teach the course. So both parties, teachers look at it for teaching, examiners ensure that they are following and they're assessing based on that specification. It's hugely important that all schemes of work are written in the centers are based on only this document, so and not necessarily to a textbook. So you will have textbooks that should work for that specification, but it's a, it's this document here that you need to ensure that all your lessons are they cover everything on there. Um, PSN Ed Excel actually publishes its own scheme of work. Uh, it's in a Word document on the website. You can then download that, and, it's, and the reason it's in a Word document is so that you can then um, adapt it into the needs, into the um, perhaps the weeks of the terms that you have there, the holidays, which are different in different areas as well. So you can make that relevant to your to the context of your school and to your um, community as well. Then we have the SAMS. Uh, those are the sample assessment materials that are also available on there, uh, papers and mark schemes on which all live examinations are based on. So they try to meet that same kind of demand, accessibility of those. Um, and where where we receive feedback, we adjust it accordingly. Um, this you, this you, there can be used for mock examinations in your centres. However, there are also other assessments now since it's be, uh, been a few years where you can adjust it um, for example, the modular one, though, as it's in you, um, uh, you would look at the sums in that case. So then if we look at the um, using this, how we use the specification, um, it will cover the specification of A and specification of B. Broadly speaking, there are six topics in specification A whereas you have 10 broad topics in specification B. So again, this is where I was saying, having this information and thinking about what's more appropriate for your students. Um, and that's the content that the centers, so all centers, all schools have to deliver. Um, and students must learn because they'll be assessed on that. Um, some A few things about the recordings, um, I'll leave that that towards the end. Some of the recordings will be on our website. I'm just looking at a, a comment on um, on the chat, um, and the resources. Um, we'll send the link again in a few minutes. Now, if we look at an example from the specification from that document that we've just mentioned here. So in this one here, the left hand side column deals with the actual content that must be taught. So it. it it, it has it there. And then on the right hand side, um, we have some clarifications and examples of possible content. Now, of course, it doesn't cover all the examples for every single thing on there. So you'd have to access different materials as well for that. But you can kind of gauge from there what you need to be uh, teaching and what the students will be assessed. So remember, both parties, examiners and teachers will refer to this document or the documents here um, for the examinations. Um, we can see a variation. So uh, if you look at that row G there, variation, direct and indirect proportion, and there are um, only eight examples of this relationship that will be examined. So they refer them to you. Um, it says, can you share your screen? Is the screen not being shared? Can, I, can everyone else see the screen? I don't know if you can give me a thumbs up or a, a nod. Some of you have the cameras. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, excellent. Okay, because I just had a comment. I was worried that I was teaching without the shared screen here. Um, then it might be, so depending on your internet connection, in some cases, the share screen comes a bit slower. And once it's on, then you can follow. Thank you very much for your comments as well. So if we look at now the content overview for, um, for MA1, um, there are two papers in the specification. Uh, so paper one and paper two. Both are written and marked by Pearson, uh, and this exam is offered twice per year. So we have the January and the June examination. By the way, if you go on to the qualifications website, and again, I'll share that later on, um, they have month by month key deadlines, whether that's entries that you have to, uh, to give, uh, whether you're put a setting foundation or higher tier, there's deadlines for that as well. Um, and then the different dates come up on there. And then there's another column on the side. So this is regarding the website um, where you can see what training is offered and what recordings are also available for it. So I'll refer to that later uh, later on. Um, so in this case here, 
All the content can be assessed in the foundation tier uh, from the six topics, and they're outlined there. You can see them, number, algebra, sequences and graphs, geometry and trigonometry, vectors and transformations, and statistics and probability. Um, just be aware that the questions aren't specifically uh, written for each one of them. So you will have questions that can address more than one topic. I mean, that's the key. That's the thing that we like from maths when we see the interlinking between the different topics. So be aware of that as well, please. Um, and then what we see here now is, so that was the foundation. Then you have the higher tier here. Um, and in this one here, all the content can be uh, assessed in the higher tier. The topics are the same as those of the foundation. Uh, note that questions are grades four and five are common to both foundation and higher tiers. So that's the crossover bit that we can see. The last 40 marks of the foundation paper will be the first 40 marks of the higher paper as well. And that's an indication as well. If your students can access those 40 marks at the end, then perhaps it's considered in the higher tier as well. So, and that's the, it's, it's worth when you have students that you're not sure which one to put to see if they can access that as well. Because if they can access those, uh, it will be more challenging for them to get marks. And they'll be getting marks here and there from the rest of the questions. So, but that's that's one of the indications that you can have. Now, we then have problem solving. Um, we, they give a weight to that in each of the uh, papers and tiers as well. Um, so here's, for example, um, what you can see, how they split that. Um, we will look at this in more detail later, but you can see the percentages of the problem solving and the reasoning questions on each paper. Uh, they can be applied on any topic, the problem solving marks, although the reasoning questions tend to come from the algebra and geometry. So it's being aware when you teach that to have, offer those re reasoning opportunities within that. There's, there's, there's ways that you can ask questions or perform discussions and not just give those questions for them so that you can train them and, 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 and build those skills so that they can then support them with that. Um, there is a greater percentage on problem solving than is on the higher tier than the foundation, as the foundation are more fluency kind of um, uh, questions where you have the right or wrong, whereas here um, they give a bit more weight on the higher tier. And again, that's another factor to take into account when you're choosing between um, the two tiers. Now, if we look at a similar in a similar way, if we look at the 4MB1, um, just to understand that. Um, we've got, again, um, we can see um, in this case here, uh, by the way, I should mention that two papers, um, and they are twice per year as well, January and June. The papers are different in structure, and paper one is weighted at one third of the total examination, and paper two is weighted two thirds of the whole. So you can see that there's something to consider here, which is different to the other specification. Um, if we then look a bit deeper here within the topics, we did I did mention earlier on that there are 10 topics so that, to, to actually teach the students. You have the numbers, set theory, um, algebra functions, matrices, geometry, um, vectors, transformations, trigonometry, statistics, and probability. Um, I think I missed maybe one there. Um, but they're basically on the screen there. And again, um, one of the questions on the papers can address more than one of these topics at any point in time as well. Similarly, if we are looking at the uh, problem solving, uh, here you can see the weights of the problem solving. So in both paper one and paper two, you got 30%, whereas the other one you have 20%. So with the other specification, you have the choice to go for foundation, uh, which are the weights are slightly less. And this goes back to what I mentioned again about knowing your students and what's better fit for them, depending on the center that you you are and the students that you accept or you have in your school. Um, a quick reference on the examiner's report now. The Examiner's reports are incredibly useful documents. Um, they highlight in detail what went well uh, and what needs attention from the centers. The examiner's reports are also on the exam wizard, results plus, which I'll mention again later on if you haven't utilized it, um, which will, and we'll deal with that later in the presentation. 
However, it's it's worth um, looking at them as they as they are published. Um, they highlight key misconceptions, and you get to understand and then compare how your students went across uh, internationally as well, um, and any common trends they usually highlighted within that. Uh, a good point then to reflect in your practice, or perhaps choose a different method or different approach to teach a topic. Um, or if you're, it's your first time of teaching it, to perhaps be aware of where students um, are going wrong, uh, what the strengths to then um, highlight that within your lesson as well. And I'll mention a few other things about this. So if we go back to for MA1 now to look at this a bit in a bit more detail. So if I give you a minute to have a, a read to this, um, I in case you have a small screen, I'll read this out loud as well. Uh, I just need to move the chat slightly out the way. So students who uh, were well prepared for the, so this is an example here from the foundation, and Tiash mentioned that first. Students who were well prepared for the this paper made a good attempt at the majority of the questions. The questions involving multi-stage calculations, for instance, question eight and question 17, were often not completed by students who generally showed a lack of understanding on how to proceed. On the whole, students tended to show their working, but for some students, the need to show all stages must be stressed to enable them to maximize their mark uh, gaining potential. Uh, I mean, I, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, how many times do we uh, mention this to students about showing all the working? But that's something that was picked up, especially for those questions. So it's worth then having a look at those questions, uh, looking at uh, the examples, because sometimes I put um, examples as well of what, how students lost those marks. Uh, and then perhaps even a task that I'll do is maybe perhaps give, print those questions, get the students to mark them with the marks themselves later on, and, and make them realize that you would have lost those marks if you uh, hadn't shown those extra workings. Uh, or perhaps even ask them to um, do a model answer. Do you show how would they get the full marks and then compare it back again with the marks. Uh, working was frequently shown uh, and easy to follow through. There were some instances where students failed to read the question properly. For example, in question 16a, students regularly found 40% of a half of the books, while 16b, some students worked out the percentage of 15 and did not realize that this was a question on reverse percentages. A striking weakness in students was the method of solving simultaneous equations on the whole problem solving questions, and those assessing mathematical reasoning were not tackled well, particularly question 21. So you're reading this and then you want to kind of gauge back in, uh, to the actual paper and then refer. So there will be an examiner's report for every assessment. Um, so it's worth when you have a group of students and they've gone through the examination once this is released to refer back to and, and have a look at that. Um, a few other key points within the examiner. So if we look at this one here, some of the comments which do appear series after series indicate uh, successive cohorts of students continue to make the same errors as well. So it's, they also gauge it over time and they, they show their experience from being examiners, uh, which is then important for us to take uh, back. Um, the requirements for questions asking to explain the, that they need a conclusion. And that's something that it's mentioning here as well within the question, if you look at where my mouse is. So it's, it's important and I do value them. So we shouldn't neglect the examiner's report. Uh, it gives us that opportunity to address uh, any things that come up and also reflect it. Perhaps your class or your students um, don't have that. So again, some either your students are very able or you've addressed it already, which is great. Um, but it's being aware and having a read uh, of um, what the examiners um, notice when they're marking all this. If you look at this one here, paper one, question eight, we have a geometrical reasoning question from the June. Um, this was, I think this was last year. And then it says the reasoning element, you can see that there where it says, give a reason for each stage of your working. Um, so it's important for us um, to highlight that. Um, if you look at here, the examiner's report on this one, and I'll, I'll read this one as well, in case you can read on the screen so we can be aware. Um, I'll leave that there. There were a high number of responses that showed little understanding of how to proceed in this multi-step question to find the size of an angle on a diagram. 
Some basic misconceptions appeared regularly, such as assuming that the line DB dissected angle ABC and angle ADC. Working that developed from this was in a uh, flaw, basically. Encouragingly, there was also that many students who completely reached the correct answer for the size of the angle. Of this significant number lost one or both of the remaining two marks as they failed to give any reasons or gave reasons that were not sufficient. For example, a triangle is 180 degrees. Could not gain credit. So again, it's about the wording that we, we, we have, and we have to train our students to use the right sentences as well. There needs to be some kind of reference to the angles in the triangle adding up to 180. So even though you can see from there, the students would or kind of have an understanding of the mathematical problem, that them not writing the right sentence down, or a full sentence basically, and a mention of the angles would have lost them a mark then. Likewise, angles in a circle are 360 degrees, did not receive credit, as we needed to see the expressed with the reference to the angles at the point adding up to 360 degrees. This and the omission of the mention of isosceles were the main reasons for the small number of students being awarded the full five marks. Students should also be aware that showing the working, however detailed, is not the same as giving reasons. So specifically in a question where it mentions the reasons, it's in making sure they write a statement and the statement has to include those references that we mentioned here. So it's about getting the students and correcting the students when they mention those within the classroom to then correct them, stop them so that they can uh, achieve all the marks. It's frustrating sometimes because when I have discussion with the students, they'll tell me that's what I meant. Uh, however, um, I need we need to point out that in the real uh, the actual live exam, that won't be the case. I wouldn't get the marks. And uh, therefore, we should be strict as well uh, when we're marking homeworks. Uh, when we're marking assessments as well, uh, or mocks, for example. Um, again, I'll read a few of the comments here, um, only as because as Pearson wanted us to make sure that we understand the need of, of those and because there's uh, repeated uh, issues within the exams. Some students are over-reliant on their calculators, and when asked to show full working, they're unable to show all the steps involved. They also do not know the full working of their calculator, and for instance, they need to use brackets around a negative number in order to square it, such as for completing the uh, table for the quadratic graph. And again, a typical thing I do with them as well when they type it in, the weaker students, especially in my old school, um, they would type in a negative number, square it, uh, and then we would be arguing and having a discussion. Um, whereas, for example, minus two squared, the calculator, they'll say it gives you the wrong answer. Um, but then it's realizing that it's also the, the need of the brackets there. So there's the good use of the calculator and the right, correct way of using it, as well as making sure that we introduce the calculator when necessary and not being over reliant on the, onto it as well. Um, there are still some students who do not show their complete method and centers would benefit from spending time with future cohorts practicing showing all the steps of their solutions. Completing the square, probably vector search and simultaneous equations, one quadratic and one linear, seem to be the weakness for many students. Operation, operations involving negative numbers were also a weakness. So here, those were some of the key trends um, that they wanted us to highlight in today's session. Uh, but please, please, please have a look at the um, examiner's report on each assessment, uh, for example, the most recent one as well. In a similar way, uh, we'll look at the 4MB1 in case you're using that one. Um, and then in this case here, Um, we can see now one key, one question I could I could ask and for us to reflect upon on, uh, in this case here is whether it's also worth once they do an assessment or a mock um, could we apart from giving back the papers with the marks and maybe the marks and give the students the examiner's report or abstracts of it that are relevant to them so that they can see um, and sometimes to boost their confidence in other times to actually come to the realization themselves. So you could discuss, decide which examiner's re uh, reports you can then show back to the students for them to read as well. So this doesn't have to be just for the teachers. Um, now, in addition that if we look at the underlying sentence on the screen there, 
in addition, students should also be advised to read the demands of the question very carefully before attempting to answer it as well. Um, sometimes it's the, the marks as well that are attributed towards a question that kind of indicates how much work they want to give. And I'm sure we mentioned this, but that's emphasizing it as well. Um, he also says at the bottom to enhance performance in future series centers should focus on students' attention on the following topics. So they've given us some topics where students don't seem to be doing that well every year. So they're asking us to give a bit more weight on this. Um, again, if you look at the questions, the questions there, they have the command word show, um, which then requires a conclusion as well. It's what they mentioned earlier on. So that's something to be aware of there, please. Now, I've mentioned a few things with the examiner's reports here. Uh, I've mentioned about giving them in class after the mark schemes. I've mentioned about giving it to the students. Um, in another example I mentioned is about giving the students to mark an, an, an exemplar and then refer back to. I'll give an opportunity here for a minute to anyone else um, that, again, to encourage sharing. Has anyone else has used the um, examiner's reports or mark schemes in any different way? Um, if you want to unmute yourself now, um, I don't know if Claire can hear me, if we can allow a muting here, um, or if on the chat, it would be nice to hear anyone else who's used examiner's reports or mark schemes in any other way um, for us to listen and take rascals as well. I'll give a minute to anyone who'd like to either type or unmute themselves. So again, have you used it in any other way for your teaching um, that support the students and how? That would be great to, to share this. Just to give another minute to encourage if anyone has it. Yep, so um, thank you. Uh, can learn many any tips from mistakes made by the students, giving correct answers and get students to identify the error and correct them. Yep, great. It provides support to teachers to explain misconception and mistakes. I have used the examiner's report even when teaching middle school to make them understand what's required. Um, usually I let the mark uh, the mark the question themselves using the mark team. Um, I have used the examiner's report to really show students how they are going to be awarded marks or not. So we can see this is a, a nice typical exercise from a few people. I would only mention this. I'll mention this again later on. Um, we did a task, and I think there's an online session on this every now and then, and it's worth it's worth doing this, is there are, there are questions where you look at the mark scheme, or so before you, but when you look at examples of questions, and that's something to do between you yourselves before you mark a mock exam. Um, you take the exemplars, you look at the mark scheme, you then decide, do I give them the mark here or there? And then you look at the mark scheme in itself, and look at the examiner's report and see, did you give the same marks? And you'll find that there will be ex there will be some gray areas where you have a disputing thing. You know, I would have avoided my students here, or I think they were too lenient here. Um, and of, of course, all the examiners are then where, where there's an inconsistency there, they're reviewed, but there's, a, there's a, a quite a comprehensive system here where they will then check and everyone will be awarded the same way. But what I noticed, for example, in my team where we have about, we're between about 12 students, 12 teachers, sorry. When we come to mock, mocks, we want to ensure that we're all marking consistently and therefore doing a practice like that, so taking some exemplars from examiner's reports on the paper that we're going to use, um, marking it without looking at that, so I remove the marks, then we have a discussion, then we have a look and make sure we've all given the same amount of work. That's a good way of moderating our work as well um, and making sure that we are, if even if we disagree, we align ourselves to the way that the examiners will do as well. Um, and that's a task as well that we've, we've used. A few more comments here before we move on. Um, 
use uh, the mark scheme at my current school where language is a problem in the learning process. Students understand better to see the actual awarding of marks on the mark scheme. They understand better how to answer the example of the show that question here. And then we have the dis a discussion between the differences of those examples in the chat. So again, thank you uh, a lot for, for the different um, examples of, of practice. Uh, and as you can see, depending where you are in the context of your students, the literacy part of the math becomes more important um, to, to then train and to teach. Uh, it might be that some of the best examples um, that you might display in, in your class as well, or some of the command words that you can display again in the, in, in the classroom. There's some posters for this as well that you can download. So you don't have to sit and create yourselves that, and then you can display them on in the classroom so that students even if you're not addressing or referring to them when they're constantly seeing the command words as they're walking in the classroom um they start to get used to that so that's a few things to to keep in mind as we as we um consider the different issues here that have come up thank you again um I've got one or two more, I'll, I'll, I'll mention them as well. Some of the students confusing why this answer is incorrect. It supports uh, for the teachers to explain misconceptions and mistakes. The only thing I noticed through uh, is that sometimes it is not clear if students can or have been penalized for some of their work and uh, not giving the final answer to three significant figures. Yes, and that's, that's something to be aware of and we have to get them used to that. Um, Misconceptions is a big thing. And I think the more experience, some of us who are, depending on our experience on teaching the different topics or um, we are aware of them, so we put them in practice. And um, they slightly de uh, differ, differ between students and ability and backgrounds, uh, but they're common and they're common across the world. So again, there's some really nice uh, textbooks as well where they highlight that if, if you're quite new in the profession as well. Um, and those are worth, we'll mention a few in the second session, but they're worth having a look so that you can preempt them instead of constantly, or, or sometimes it's about creating the lesson or the task that will bring them about so that you can address them. Um, there's some really nice resources on variation as well, where they tackle misconceptions. Variations are basically um, a topic, there's questions, and they slightly change between the questions. So it's not differentiation where you have easy, medium, and, and hard, but there are they could have 20 questions there for their self-practice as well, where as they go from one to the other, something small changes and allows them to make that connection. And then they find, and, and then it also tries to tackle different misconceptions. Those resources are available online. Um, they're in textbooks that you can order, but there's also available free resources, which I'll share towards the end in the support section. So that can help with the things that you've mentioned as well. Uh, everything that we mentioned is it's, it's all about the planning that we do. Um, so being prepared for, for the students that we have of different ability, of different levels as well. Um, and making sure that we consider that. So what we need to make sure we do is cover the specification. Um, we need to uh, look at the year plan, lesson plan, schemes of work, and they're all available in the PSN so that you can adapt them. The reason I mentioned year plan as well is because it depends if you're choosing, when you're choosing to enter the students for the exams. Um, also, depending on which country you're working, the difference holidays, that are slightly different between the one uh, or the other. So it's it's making sure that you're aware of that and tailoring it to that. And um, most schools will have a school calendar with different events on as well. Um, we are quite good at extracurriculum uh, within my school. There's so many trips, they're all available on our calendar. So we have to be make sure because there'll be students out that I'll miss my lessons. So I'll have to plan around those as well. Um, so and that's why it's important um, and the schemes of work to be adjusted so that when you're choosing to do your assessments or your mocks are aligned within the, that so that's how it all comes together as well i'll come back to the, the the there was another point in the chat i'll come back to it as we moved on but i'll in the next point um how do i make sure now that i cover all the content um, the slide, the next slide that we're going to see here is a screenshot of the year planner, which is in the schema work document. Uh, it has all the topics within the specification ref with references and the estimated teaching hours of the module. 
Now, that's only um, when we mention the hours, that's only a reference because, like I said earlier on, it's you, you if that's the average, if you have really able students, you know you're going to need less time. If you've got weaker students with language barriers or anything else, you're going to need longer. So you have to take that into account as you put this together. Uh, they're only a suggested one, okay? And these are the suggested teaching modules. They're published in a Word document so you can adjust it yourselves. But it's that's kind of the point of reference there. That's an average. Do you have really able students that get the top grades usually in your in your school? Let probably less time. Weaker students, more time, and therefore you can adjust it um, accordingly. Then we have an example of a lesson plan. Um, so here's an example of that. Um, this specific example is on bounds. Uh, the plan has the success criteria, opportunities and problem solving, common misconceptions, and uh, which some questions are relevant to that. You have that at the bottom there. Um, now, the misconceptions area there will support you. Something that we've done on top of this in the GCSE version, but we're looking at doing it in the international one as well, um, we have added an extra point where um, where can you use technology? And when I say technology, online software, um, graphic tools, um, graphic calculators, scientific. So opportunities to consider a bit about that, to go a bit deeper within that and how you can use it. And um, there's also links to Georgia Bra um, within that. Now, it's not currently on the international one, but what you can do for now while we create that is go into the GCSE version of it and then go to the relevant topic, which is similar to yours, and take the links from there. Um, and that's something that might help you as well within the teaching because you'll address some of the misconceptions. So some of those ideas are to go a bit deeper. Some of them are to introduce a topic and some of them are to kind of bring out a misconception uh, and get the students to explore, to ask the why things happen. Um, and that's that's how we were we consider about putting that. Now, the next bit here is the first activities. Um, this is where I said you might have preferred to write down. I mean, you don't need to actually have it printed, but in our booklets that uh, we sent you that link uh, at the beginning of the session, um, it has the lesson planning activity here, uh, which I will give you about five minutes uh, to consider. Now, if you don't have it printed, um, you can have a, just a, a sheet of paper there where you can make some, some notes on there. Give me one second, sorry. So if you if we have a look at this, um, think, make a note and type in the chat. The type in the chat, please do that later on. So for the first five minutes, just consider these questions, make a few points, uh, and then I'll ask you, I'll invite you to, to share some. So how do you plan your lessons in mathematics? Do you, for example, have a common lesson structure? I mean, in some schools I've worked at here in the UK, you are very restricted to have a specific template, the lesson objective on every slide, the keywords on a different slide, the objectives of the success criteria on every beginning of every lesson. In other, in others, which um, in other in other schools, it allows it's a bit more flexible, allows creativity, but then they they approach it by looking at the schema work, like I mentioned earlier on. We do hyperlinks. We then click on those hyperlinks to specific resources. We look at an example of the, the most difficult example that we need to get our students, and we start to create that. So different schools, even here, do them very differently. So a question off to you to reflect, because it's very interesting to hear from you as well and to hear each other as well. How do you plan your lessons? What's the approach? Where's your start, starting point? How do you ensure you have covered the whole specification on that topic? What concerns do you have about planning the course? Are there ways uh, you might need to adapt your methods of lesson plan to deliver the specification? Feel free to go through all, every single question on there or just have a th reflection there, a few points, and then I'll invite you to either unmute yourselves again or share and see if it's done differently across the world. So five minutes, please. I'll mute myself in this case here um, and turn off the camera. If you have another question, please type it in the chat. I'll be watching here. But I'll give you five minutes. It's 46 to 51. Um, and then I'll just to give you a chance to think.
Right. Thank you again for um, taking part in that. Some of you have already started sharing. Uh, if we look at the chat. So Anna here has said structure wise, the only thing I do is make sure for the students to have some independent and preferable exam like practice closer to the end of the lesson. After finishing a bigger module, um, revision lessons, we would look at the corresponding part of the specification with the students to make sure they all know what was required and we can all see if we have covered all the material. The main issue that I have is that the office students book doesn't follow the logic of the lesson plan offered. Both are great, but totally inconsistent. Um, and in that case here, uh, I, I, I'm sometimes frustrated. I, I use a variation of resources in my lessons. Um, I'm not officially meant to, but I'm not endorsing anything here. Not, and I'm not talking on behalf of Pearson. I'm talking on behalf of my own experience again. Um, so I've got, I'll have uh, resources from um, publishers online who have worksheets created. And I'll mention a few later on. Um, in terms of books as well with variation, um, again, you don't have to buy them. You've got online worksheets as well um, that do variation quite well. Um, PSN has its own one as well. Uh, but again, you don't have to buy that one. Um, but that will that would help then link with what you're doing. I'll, I'll come and mention everything towards the end when the support. But from schema work codes are given them. Um, I may see a six math teacher. Um, I don't know if Claire's there as well, by the way, if anyone, can we just mute while I'm speaking, please, um, so we don't have any background noise. I'm a year six math teacher. I do my lesson plan according to the textbooks that we have to teach and the topics that I should cover before the um, I primary math exam to prepare the students. Uh, another person put first, I do a mental question and warm up that could facilitate the process of teaching and then relate to the real life, trying to make it long term learning. Um, then three, divide the lesson into milestones, asking the students feedback after each part, then allow independent practice, finally giving the students feedback to make sure that they got to the idea. I'm guessing in between all these different variations, there'll be opportunities where you're assessing the students' understanding. Um, and I'm sure you do that. Um, and that's crucial because, as we know, in maths, there'll be different points that different people have different needs. So it's how do we know where where do we where students um, have a misconception and uh, and it'd be nice it'd be nice to have methods of addressing at different points. Um, what I found because if we don't forget back to our lockdowns or any other thing when we had our laptops and in some classes we have computers and tablets, um, some of those multiple choice questions um, are quite useful for this as well. So uh, and and in our sixth form we allow the mobile phones. So I will then set up my class and up a code similar to things like uh, Kahoot as well, for example, where they put the questions. And then there's different ways of approaching this, or where you know that question has a misconception uh, within that, and then gauging. Because then if it's a live kind of activity, you can't immediately have this data to tell you at any point where you've lost a student. And now you don't have to devise all this. There's, there's multiple choice questions. Uh, Mr. Barton's ones are quite popular. Um, and you can find them by topic. You then can set up your class. And that's all free as well, by the way. Um, and then those you can then throw them in uh, at any point within your lesson. The difference with using a small white, and again, if if you're in the luxury of having technology, by the way, because I am I'm aware that different schools around the world will have different needs within this, or a paper or a whiteboard where they can put an answer on there. So you could access those resources. You can have a look. If you don't have access to technology, you can put the question at the front, and then you can they can they can raise that, and you can gauge quickly and have a quick understanding. Or if you don't want to do that either, you can have your multiple choice. You can give sheets out. They put their answers in there. You can just scan them through. The, the advance of technology, automatic, immediately, you have the feedback in front of you. And I've done that many times. Um, I've done that throughout the lesson. So similar, as I was reading here, and uh, that person's kind of structure, I've done it throughout. But I've also done it sometimes at the end, preparing me for the next lesson, thinking, right, this is a new class. I'm not sure what they know, prior knowledge. I'm going to throw a quick quiz like this with multiple choices. And I, I want to create a template here to understand. And my experience with using the same kind of quiz with those multiple choices 
um, I get to understand, okay, the needs and where I start my class as well. Um, what's nice with the Mr. Barton's ones is that you can get insights of all the students and all the schools I've used it as well. So you can see beforehand where where those misconceptions and there's some feedback on that. Um, a nice task for us to do, which if, if it wasn't uh, an online one here, and maybe perhaps for you and your departments to do, or you to have a look is, um, have a look at those questions, those misconception questions, and then ask yourself, what do you think, not, not, not is the correct answer, the most typical incorrect answer that the students will give? And then at that point, you then have a look at the actual insights and see if, if you were right, and then you can read the feedback of why that happens. And then by by understanding where the students will go wrong, you can address that before they even go wrong. So, and your, your students will have an advantage. So that's that's another one. Um, if I carry on looking at that chat a few more minutes, uh, pretty straightforward, started to get focused, present notes, do a several examples, have them do an exercise, clarify for individual students, and then summarize at the end uh, and analytic questions online teaching. Okay. Um, another person says, I usually plan for my lessons two, three days prior. I think about what topic I want to cover and consider the usual difficulties students might encounter. Then after I consider this, I move on to finding resources that match the objectives. When I do this, I also want to target resources that will help explain the possible misconceptions. Um, I do like I do like the idea of, of a few lessons before, because then we can also think about the sequence of our lessons as well, and we think of it as a journey. And as we have more and more experience, it's that journey of our students and being able to visualize and see the path that we want to take them on um, and the misconceptions, we can tailor the lessons um, to help direct the students there. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, another person said lesson plan. Uh, it differs depending on where we are on the topic and how I feel students performed in the previous lesson or test. If at the beginning of a topic, I will have a starter question. If I will return a test, I may write on the board some interesting answers for the students to analyze, look at good answers, identify misconceptions. I like that too. And um, that reminded me, yeah, I've, I've scanned a few of them before, I took photos, put them on a display, I removed the names, and then we were discussing all that. And sometimes I even printed them on, on an A3 sheet with different kinds of questions. There. And I said, let's dive into and have a look at this as well. To, to ensure I cover the specification, I read referred to it at the beginning of the year before setting uh, mock exams and when preparing students for the final exam. Concerns about planning this course, I have now come uh, some concerns because I just joined a new school and it is not as easy when taking over from three different teachers, students had in year 10. That is a challenge. So I am having to find out what students know have covered before teaching them anything else. As a dep now, if I speak as a deputy head teacher now, I fully understand this because there's always a dilemma at the school. Do we structure and make sure that every department has a similar structure so that as students move between teachers, it's easier? Or do we leave them to be flexible and creative so that every teacher can give their own input their own way? And that's something that is a challenge. And one of the reasons like, it is because of this thing here as well. How, if we're moving students or teachers around, especially within the actual course, how do we ensure that we know what the gaps were, we know what's been taught, what hasn't been taught? And those are the systems that you as a teacher, and unfortunately in this case here, you're having to do that, you take your own initiative here um, and find the teachers and talk to the teachers. And again, some of the teachers might have left. Um, so those are some of the problems uh, and concerns that we have, and I, and I fully I fully appreciate that as well. And um, so that's working together with your heads of department or with your school and seeing how that can that can support you um, and hopefully thinking about a system as well where you share information and share practices within departments as we're doing now. Um, there's quite a few, I'm worried about time here, but so if I ask you to scan through any of them, thank you everyone for writing. There's quite a few things here. Um, I'm just looking and someone's also put some of the resources in the last one as well. So feel free to read them um, within that. Um, what I will ask quickly again, um, and, I, and I should have asked at the start, but maybe we do in the second module, is, is knowing where different people are signing in from, because it's actually interesting to see how, even though we are joining from different areas and different parts, 
the maths, the maths issues, the math things we're considering are similar across. Um, so I'm going to have to stop with this task and move on here due to timing. Uh, and then go to our second uh, module here, which is a second session, which is about assessments and the objectives of assessments here. So again, thank you very much. Um, someone's already put that. So yeah, nice to hear. Thank you very much for joining us from there. Uh, but I'll ask you at the beginning of the second session, because I think it'll be interesting for people to see the different areas that people are from. And then when we're talking, actually, things are very similar across the world. Um, introduction to, in terms of the, the maths, by the way, in terms of the maths, the teaching of the maths. Um, then how is this content assessed? So um, if I move to the second one, so it's a second session about assessments. Um, we've got um, a flow chart here on the screen. The red box here, the, um, we've got the papers are marked, the papers and maxims are written starting approximately two years before the date of the examination, which is why when you have an introduction, it tells you first teaching this, first assessment here. This is usually what they try to do. There are eight stages of writing, uh, committee meetings, and scrutiny in the preparation of assessment materials. You expect, and I, I myself expect, that when I send my students for the examination, those papers will be correct, the maximum will be correct, and the students, it would be fair. That's the ideal world, and that's the ideal scenario. So that's what they aim to do. Uh, the blue box here that you have on the screen, so the one next to it there, dates of the examinations are given well in advance and students sit the papers, which are then packed by your examination officer and sent to Pearson um, in the UK for scanning. The green box then below, uh, after scanning, the principal examiner uh, and her or his team look at samples of candidate responses to get a feel for the way in which the papers were answered and finalize the mark scheme. We move to the purple box uh, below. All scripts are marked electronically except for an example in large scripts. The principal examiner and the team leader constantly checks the marking if, if it's accurate. A double check is the inclusion of pre-marked scripts by the senior team into the, everyone's allocation. And then you have the yellow one on completion of marking. The marks are analyzed statistically and preparations made for the awarding meeting, which decides on the grade boundary. So the grade bounds are only produced at the end of the uh, sitting. The awarding committee looks at scripts from the previous session to make sure that standards are uniform from year to year. So that's the kind of an outline of the process that takes place um, uh, when it comes to uh, awarding marks um, and marking our, our students' papers. Now, I did mention earlier on, and I will, I will touch upon the modular um, specification as well. So this, um, this was introduced um, in the last year or two that was mentioned, uh, and it was an option. It's an advantage of the international GCSE in terms of this is only offered for internationally and not for the normal GCSE here. Um, so I'll touch a bit about, upon this, but if you want to know more information, if you um, uh, either speak to the Pearson representatives in your areas for that, or there's online sessions to also um, look at as well. I'm um, sorry. So uh, what we have here, um, the content of the specifications of the of the modular one does not change to the linear one. Um, it might change the order in which things you might choose to teach them, but both of the examinations and specifications stay in the same in terms of content. If you have any questions about the modular, as, as I said, speak to the local representative, um, look at the website, and there's also recorded sessions on this as well that you can look at. And I'll mention where you can find them afterwards. Um, in terms of, now uh, I should mention that Pearson is the only exam board to offer now the choice of modular and linear routes for the students. Um, if you're happy with the linear approach, there's no pressure to move to the modular one. You should, you don't need to, um, the linear international GCC will continue to be offered. Um, and as a taken widely across, as from students around the world. If you do believe that the modular one uh, will benefit that, uh, your students, um, then uh, that's something that you could consider. It might be that um, the type of students or the families that you have in your school might prefer that when you when you have that. So therefore, um, we can then support you in delivering that and the Pearson um, local representative can give you more resources or direction with that as well. 
Um, and then what do you have here in front of us down the screen? We have, um, we can see um, how the units are split here. The modular linear contain the same content, but the modular breaks the journey into two units with an exam at the end of each unit. Uh, if you're already offering Pearson uh, at Exo International GCSE linear, this will continue to be offered, as I mentioned earlier on. Students, um, now you can see here uh, in the red, topics in red are studied by the higher tier students only. So you can see how the topics are also split here between foundation and higher. So as I mentioned, the modular one, you get to choose the units and sit them throughout the year. You don't, they're not assessed on the whole content at once uh, as the linear one. Um, so it goes similar to the the old, uh, well, the old, very old GCSE, but and the old A-level where you get to choose the modules. So therefore, if you have students who could do with a smaller kind of content in the exams and building it upon this, this is one thing that you could do. Also, it might be the way that they split uh, the foundation and higher that, that you might find that useful as well. Um, students taking the linear will have studied all the content before the exam. So our linear specification is structured in a way where all the topics can be assessed in both exam papers. Whereas here, you can see that they split them and separate them. Now, examination on both routes contain a mixture of different question styles, including multiple choice questions, short answer questions, calculations, and extended open response questions. And a calculator may be used in the examinations as well. So a few things here. Uh, for you uh, to consider. Uh, let me see what else we have. Here's the um, the other one as well, for you to have a look on the screen. There are some guides that can help you understand the module of Feather, and this can be found on the website, um, and there's a maths guide as well. Uh, within that, you will also have the following resources there available as well from course planners, uh, schemes of work like the, the linear one I mentioned and the static guides. Those are on the qualifications website. The link I'll send later on as well. Now, I did say that the first teaching for um, for the International GCSE A modular it was this year. Uh, and then the first kind of module can be set in next May, June. Okay, so that's something um, for you to have a look at. I'll answer some of the questions in a minute as well. Now, uh, another thing to consider here, where are we? Um, if you have a look at a few more points here on the screen, learners can receive any unit irrespective of whether the qualification is to be cashed in or not. If a learner receives a unit more than once, only the better of the two most recent attempts of the unit will be available for aggregation to qualification grade. Results of units will be held in PSN at Excel's unit bank for as many years as the specification remains available. Once international GCSE in mathematics A modular has been certified, all unit results are deemed to be used up at that level. These results cannot be used again towards a further award of the same qualification at the same level. Okay, so that's a few things. So this is the, the modular of the Mathematics A that they've introduced. And it says here as well, the module root of the assessment is only available for the International Mathematics A, and that answers kind of a, someone's question from earlier on about the B. So it's only for the A module, please. Um, so if we now look at the assessment objectives, thank you for sharing the link as well. By the way, someone asked for that. We're going to go back to 4MA1 and look at the assessment objectives of it. Um, in this case here, one second, sorry. Um, you'll notice the assessment objective. So I mentioned something about the difference between mathematics A and B earlier on um, in terms of one offering math, uh, foundation and higher, but also the style of questioning as well in mathematics B. That's another one um, that you need to consider. So I'll, I'll go back to them as well as we talk about the objectives. Um, so in this case, yes, if you look at the objectives of 4MA1, there are three assessment objectives. 
The assessment objective one is a number and algebra and counts between 57 and 63 marks on each paper. Uh, assessment objective two is a geometry and vectors and accounts for 22 to 28 uh, marks on each uh, paper. And then finally, assessment objective three uh, is the statistics and probability and it's 12 to 18. So you, again here, you can see the weighting of the different topics here. And those are our assessment objectives. The other thing to consider is the problem solving and reasoning we mentioned earlier on, which will then be through, uh, embedded throughout all the those assessment objectives. So it's quite a difficult challenge to get the weighting of the topics of these assessment objectives against the problem solving and reasoning and make sure that between papers and between year on year, the difficulty remains the same. And I'll, I'll explain that again in more detail in a few minutes. So again here, if you look at um, the assessment objectives, how they're spread in the same way on each paper, and so you have 1F and 2F, you have 1H and 2H there, and then you have the totals there um, as you see, as uh, between the objectives. And then if we look at the assessment objective one separately, I'll give you another minute to look at those figures. Um, so if we look at the assessment objective one, we have um, 57 to 63% of marks here. However, when you look at, if we look at, for example, here, um, the foundation concentrates on number, whereas higher concentrates on algebra, and you can see the ratio at which that split. Um, and of course, this could be a factor in deciding whether students should sit the foundation or higher. The emphasis is in the higher is weighted much more towards the algebra, which is important for progression to A-level. And that's one of the reasons they do that. Um, I, In terms of resources for it, I can comment later on in terms of books, by the way, I'm just referring to the question on the chat. In terms of books, uh, I can't talk about the publishing side Um as as the qualification I'm, I'm i'm representing the qualification side not the publishing they're kind of split even though they're kind of one together um but do look out for this space and 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 you will have your answer but um i'll mention the qualifications the resources in a few minutes if we then look at the uh papers and that you have there uh all the content from the specification can be assessed on each paper uh, two hours in length, 100 marks for each paper. They target grades one to five with approximately 20 marks at each of the five grades. It's ramped in difficulty so that grade one questions are at the beginning of the paper uh, and then the grade fives are at the end of it. Calculates are allowed in both papers as well. So that's some of the information there to make sure that you're aware of as we do that. If we then look at the higher one, um, again, all content can, will be assessed, can be assessed uh, from this specification. Uh, two hours of length, 100 marks each paper, and the targets from grades four to nine. Forty percent of the paper is targeting grades four and five. These are the common questions from the foundation tier. And 60 percent of the paper is divided equally uh, amongst the remaining grades four, um, six, sorry, amongst the, sorry, the last four grades, which is six, seven, eight and nine. So that's how they, they split that. Again, it's ramped up in difficulty. Uh, so the grade four questions are at the beginning of the paper and the grade nines are at the end and calculus can be used on both of them. In terms of mark, mark allocation, as mentioned in, in, in the previous slide, high tier will have six tiers and 40% of, of the paper is distributed equally over grades four and five, 60% on the remaining grades six to nine. All marks are distributed evenly in the foundation tier over grades one to five. So again, the weighting of that is something to consider um, where you want to assess uh, for your students. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be answering that last question on the chat as well in a minute. Um, I, and actually, I'll, I'll mention that now. Again, there's no split between topics. And um, what they try to use within the two, uh, well, actually, if we go back to the the original one, I don't know if I have it here, Let me just, just to answer the person, unless we wait till we come back. Here. 
it's basically you have they try to cover as much of the content as they can and having it is as equally as they could between the two okay um now if we look at the equivalent to the 4b um and see how that's split in the papers and the assessment objectives behind them. Let me just show my slides here. Yep. So in this case here, we have three assessment objectives um, again, um, and this is the uh, specification B if you choose to do that. Um, the assessment objective one is number and algebra and accounts between 57 and 63 marks on each paper. The second objective is geometry and vectors, 22 to 28. And objective three, statistics and probability, 12 to 18 marks. And in this case here, you can see the assessment objectives between the two papers again and the total. Um, that note that the split of the assessment objectives on each paper, you have assessment objective one, two, and three is about thirty percent, twelve point five and seven point five. Um, they're about and they're approximations, so you can't have them to account if it's not exact. Uh, but they try to have um, they try to have uh, a range from the whole specification as well. I'm sorry, someone wanted a previous slide. I'll go back for a minute. Here you go. Uh, and the answer to the person who wrote about that, yes, they could assess again the same question, but in a different context or a different weighting. So in one of them, it could be more fluency. The other one, it could be more applied, um, give it, or giving more problem solving or reasoning, or it could be a, a part of the use of a different topic. Um, so like you mentioned, the quadratic solving quadratic equations, it could arise from a, a probability kind of diagram. Um, and therefore, yes, it could it could come up in a different context. If I carry on, sorry, going backwards. So we had this slide here earlier on talking about the weighting there. And then if we look at paper one, that, so this is slightly different in the 4B. Um, paper one in this case here uh, can assess all the content from the specification. Uh, it's one hour and 30 minutes though, in length 100 marks. There are between 26 and 30 questions of basically different mark allocations from two up to seven or eight marks. There are between 26 and 30 questions, um, like I mentioned earlier on. They target grades four to nine with approximately 20 marks at each of grades four and five, and the remaining 60% will be separated between grades six to nine. Um, it is not ramped in difficulty as a three mark grade nine question would appear towards the beginning of the mark. The short questions are first finishing with the seven to eight marks as uh, afterwards so it's about it's about the 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 mark allocation the way that this is put in not necessarily by grades and again that's something to consider if you don't have confidence in students you'll either have to build that confidence and experience with them um and to expect that so that they don't lose confidence from the start if i go on to paper two Again, all contents from the specification uh, can be assessed. Paper one is two and a half hours. A hundred marks on uh, that paper. There are between 11 and 12 questions of different mark allocations. The longer questions could uh, go up to 15 marks overall. Um, targeted uh, grades are four to nine with approximately 20 marks at each grade four and five. And you got 60% uh, of the marks for grade six to nine. It's not ramped up in difficulty either, and calculators are allowed. So you can see it's a very different style here. Um, some schools wanted this um, to really boost their students who are considering A-level, um, because those 15 marker kind of questions allow a lot for kind of going deeper within the topics as well, and those connections to come out. So. Uh, have a consider that when you want to use this specification or which one to use. Um, if I then look at the overall mark allocation, 
the specification has six grades and 40% of the is distributed equally four and five, 60% of the papers distribute, are distributed equally between six and nine. And then if we compare both now specifications, um, that gives you a better kind of view within this one here. In both specifications, questions can be short response, uh, extended responses or problem solving and reasoning questions. Um, and you can see here the similarities between the two. And yes, the recording will be will be shared as well. So let's look a bit more in that sh when we, we refer to short response questions and understand the difference between the longer ones as well. So here's an example from the SAMS. Here's a, a short response question at grade one. Not particularly the command words used and the mark allocations. Um, so it says write, means no calculation is involved. Work out means calculation is required. Um, the mark allocation is very important. In this case, one mark is awarded for writing, 64% are 64 out of 100. Second mark is awarded for the simplified answer. So it's worth knowing that and then sharing that with your students. Then if we look at another example here from the foundation, uh, paper one question 22 from the A specification. Uh, it specifies the rounding uh, to be three significant figures as someone mentioned earlier in the chat. Once again, if we look at the allocation of marks, we have three that implies calculations and working out is involved and therefore all methods must be shown clearly. Um, I'll come back to resources later on if you just uh, be patient with me, sorry. Then in this case here, um, slide 63 that we're on, we're looking at the foundation paper one question 22. It says something to note and tell you here. Um, you need to make sure they show if it's three marks to remember that the final mark. Now, someone mentioned earlier on that Mark Kim said that if no working shown, um, then and they have, they have the final answer, they get the full marks. Now, that's more rare now because that implied with the calculator that they've done the calculation on there. More and more Mark Kim's now will then address that show your working. And then any any answer through the calculator without any working will get zero marks. More and more mark seems will address that as the especially the graphic calculus become more and more uh, common between between schools. So that's something to consider. We can discuss that in the next module as well when we look at some of the questions and the mark schemes and then decide how we give the marks as well. So uh, please be patient to the next session. If we look at this one here, another example of a short response question on specification B this time, it is two marks and therefore will be necessary to start, it'll be at the start of the paper. Uh, once again, it is easily possible to work out in your head, but this working must be shown at all times because uh, we've got two. So it's important that um, we consider that. Let's now have a look at the extended response questions. Here's our first example. So in this case here, we have one that you complete the square, and then it says explain why the graph of the curve of this equation does not intersect the x-axis. Now, this is a good example of an extended response. Uh, it is in two parts. The answer to part A should inform the method to part B. Now, candidates should be aware that when we set extended response questions, we often have part A leads into part B, which leads to part C. Um, in this case, the word hence implies that the result for part A should be used in part B. They added the words otherwise or otherwise because candidates need to use, if they want to use an alternative method, for example, a calculus, um, 
they will still be credited uh, all the marks as well. So it's training the students that one leads to the other, but if you can't solve the first one, and especially when it says, or otherwise, and if you know any other methods, make sure you attempt that as well. If we look at now from the part, from the B specification, we, this is a long extended response question, starting with part A at grade four and progressing through the grades to peak at part E, which requires the use of matrices. Note how triangle A is transformed into triangle B in part B, which is transformed to triangle C in part C in this case. It's worth going through this question in detail with your students. Um, and then also highlighting how it progresses as well. Now, in terms of any parts being awarded to part B for the answer part A is wrong, that's when you see the carried forward marks allocated into your mark scheme as well. So the mark scheme specify that as well. Um, a lot of you were asking about the resources and textbooks and everything else. So this was to kind of outline um, the difference between specification A, B, and the modular, but also understand the objectives behind it, which we're going to dive into more as we analyze the questions and we work together in marking some more questions and doing exactly what we say we do with students, doing it together to make sure we're aligned the way that we mark for the mocks, but also... Um, to understand a bit about how they put them together. So as we teach, we can. And now we come into module, uh, the second kind of module of this uh, training session, uh, or this was more informative, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, and again, I'll have the opportunity to ask me questions in a few minutes. So in terms of support now, um, for all of the things I mentioned today. So we've got a wide variety um, of support. And I'm hoping that you are aware of the websites that are also free as part of the PSN support that they have. Um, so in this first one here, um, you, I'll talk about some of the websites, the materials on the website in a few minutes, um, suggestions of how to use them as well uh, as we go through them. So on the actual teaching website, so when you receive this slide, you'll also have this link here, which you can click and you go straight to our qualification site. So the web page will take you back to, to that specific page. Um, and then within the page here, so you'll see you can download the specification again if you want to, which is the one that I, I mentioned earlier on. But then you've got the course materials as well, uh, where you can have a look at the exam materials, but then the teaching materials as well. Um, if it's something new or if it's something recent, it'll be locked. So you'll need your logins as well to download them or open them. So some of them will be locked. Some of them will be opened. And that's so that you can use them with your students, without your students accessing them first, uh, whether that's in um, whether that's for mocks or assessments as you as you as you have. When you click on the course materials, you'll have a similar thing like this. You'll have your guides. Uh, again, if you click on this image here, when you download your PowerPoint, you'll be able to go straight to the website uh, so you don't have to look for that. Uh, within here, we have, uh, when I mentioned about the uh, teacher mapping document, it is also here. The guides also in this one here. You will have your schemes of work in here um, that you can then download. Uh, and then the exemplars that you can use uh, either with your students or between you to then align your marking, you can also find them there as well. Um, the differences between specification and specification B, one offers foundation higher, I mentioned earlier on, the other one's just higher. Um, it, the extended, the difficulty in the way that the, um, the difficulty in terms of the questions as they appear. So one of them will be in, order of difficulty the other one will as i said will have the bigger questions at the end starting with the smaller one the grades therefore might be mixed uh the different timings in the assessments and the maximum number of marks that you can have in each one and some of the topics that are different as well and that's the things that we talked about earlier on so please go back to the slides and you can see those those things i've, I've discussed throughout this session within the teaching and learning materials here uh, as I said, you have the exemplars um, and and it's worth looking at them and then looking at, again, some of the feedback that you have. Um, 
And the teacher guides will also be on this website as well. So you can have a look at that. Um, when the PowerPoint here is the, the links, you just click on the image and it takes you there. And the link is also at the bottom that you can have. Um, and this will be all shared with your yourselves. Um, how to use the exemplar materials. Oops. So I just click on the link. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll also show you towards the end of this, I'll, I'll forward the, the, the link to you guys. Um, how to use the exemplar materials. Uh, in this case here, uh, some examples are on there. So um, they selected responses to a number of questions. Um, questions and maxims are printed out. Following each question, a range of student responses will be accompanied with examiner's comments on how to mark. Uh, and and how the to mark and how the mark scheme has been applied, and comma errors of the questions are highlighted. And that's that's hitting with the exemplars. Uh, in some of the most recent ones as well, because they've now done a few different ones. You have an Excel file where you can click based on the topic as well, and you can and you can see those. And please find that online on the Emporium website and the Maths Emporium. Um, here's an example of an exemplar question. So here's a question. You have the mark scheme. Um, and then at the bottom, you have the examiner comments here um, where they kind of give you advice as well. So that's um, that's quite helpful if you have a look at that. As I said, the more recent ones are online, you can choose by topic as well. What's nice, though, you could remove, and this is what I was saying earlier on, um, you can remove this question, this the answers from here, to the marks that are allocated and then mark it together with your team or with a colleague of yours as well, that if you share a class or if you have more than one class in your the GCC group. And yes, you will get a certificate for attending the course uh, at the end of the second module, because this is one of two. Um, here's another example of that. Uh, and then something to summarize then the overall support they have for each of the qualifications. Uh, you can see here, um, we've got from guides, the training events, whether they're face-to-face -face or online, they do offer a face-to-face -face in your areas as well. Um, subject advisor support, free access to the Maths Emporium website, schemes of work, lesson plans, skills mapping, sample assessment materials, examiners reports, exemplars, past papers, on-screen mock services as well, in some of the cases there. The exam wizard, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Uh, the resource plus, which a lot of um, schools like to use and the access to scripts, which means that you can actually access your students' uh, marked papers as well. And the second module, by the way, is this week again, and it's on the on Wednesday. So if you ask someone asks when it is, it's on the, it's on Wednesday this week, um, which will be more interactive, like I mentioned at the beginning of it. <clears throat> in terms of, apologies for that, um, so in terms of the course materials here, when you click on that, this is how the teaching, uh, the qualification website looks. If you click on the course materials, this is what comes up here by specification, uh, the sample materials, and there's more and more resources. There is a direct link, there's an email here, which you can contact the maths team. Um, they're the ones who create the resources, and they will also pass some of this work to me, myself and others uh, credible specialists at work with them to create or to answer or support you as well. And there's a number you can call uh, or go to the support portal as well. Um, but you can you can then follow the uh, follow them as well and and get any updates uh, to your emails as well. So that's just a few uh, screenshots here just to to share with that. Now, Results Plus, um, have, have people used Results Plus before? I don't know if you can give me a yes. So Results Plus um, is a free service that PSN has. So um, it automatically gets all your data. If you have your students by classroom on there, um, you will get an overview then of um, the strengths, the weaknesses, the areas of improvement of that, the top 10 topics, the bottom 10 topics based on that. And then um, you can see how you went, the, res how the residuals compared to national figures, how your per class performed uh, in terms of everyone else across the world. 
So you can then um, see the areas or topics you might want to think or work together with colleagues and maybe perhaps teach separately. So it's a very good insight into your own class of students um, and how they've done and they've performed against everyone else. You can do this for uh, mocks as well uh, because it's a quite a good service. So you want to compare how they performed. So you can upload your data for a mock as well. Or if you use the mock service, they'll also use that for you as well. That's an additional service if you want them to, to mark that. Um, so students take their exams traditionally on the paper, but once they're scanned and you, they, they're all uploaded, the, the marks are then given here. It's a good analysis here. Um, if you haven't, um, reach out to the um, regional Pearson um, representative, but also perhaps talk to, um, you can also look online because there's videos of how to use this and there's a guide of how to use this as well. Uh, but I do recommend it if you haven't utilized it before. Um, the, the way that they use the results plus, they start with the students taking the exams. Uh, the exam papers are all scanned, sent in sections to different examiners to mark. And then the performance reports are then shared through this. And you can see a screenshot here where you'll be able to get an analysis, a, more, a very detailed analysis on there. Um, if you have a department and different teachers teaching uh, the, uh, the students, um, you'll be able to get an overall <clears throat> performance of them as well as a classroom uh, and see how that's how they've done. Uh, exam wizard, that's a, a free tool that we offer as well. I utilize this a lot either for homework sheets or for uh, bespoke kind of sheets for my students, individual students sometimes for an intervention or for assessments. Um, and you can build your own assessment through that. It has all the assessments uh, up to the most recent one on there. And um, through that, you can create those bespoke assessments. So you don't have to use a past paper or the sums now that you can use this as well. And then finally, the access to um, scripts online portal. <clears throat> In this one here, yeah, you're allowed to see your students marked exam papers free of charge. It's available. Um, for all the qualifications. Uh, they will not have any annotations of the examiners or just the marks similar to the exemplars that you saw, but you'll be able to kind of see where the students got marks and where they haven't. Um, things that we've done here before is, and again, with the students, in, 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 we, we have to get permission from the students here. Um, but once you have that, uh, you can just download. We've done also a bit, of, a bit of training through this by downloading some of our most stable middle and low ability students to also then do that task of allowing our marking as well, where we hide them. In other cases, we wanted to make sure if they were close to that and, and considering whether we asked for remarks, having a look at that and seeing where they've lost marks. And is there an opportunity for us to do that? I'll come back to the access for scripts next session once we have that interactive um, activity where we are marking some of the questions together and deciding how they are. So then you'll understand why this is important as well. In terms of paid resources as well, um, you have the curriculum uh, match student books. A few of you mentioned about the student books here. And there's also the teaching hubs, exam practice books, and revision guides as well. So they're offered um, that you can. Uh, you don't have to have them in order to offer the qualification, but they're also available. In terms of textbook, um, you don't. This isn't the only one. It's a published textbook here for you to use. And there's one for the um, specification A, there's also the B. And yes, you're right that this is a student book um, and the teacher book, you might want to have some of the misconceptions and so on. I would suggest that you look online for some resources where some people have offered online uh, presentations or PowerPoints that you can use alongside them. Um, the new teaching hub that's been on for over a year now, um, and that supports your planning in front of class guidance. So perhaps you might want to consider this one. Um, it's not a necessary. I'm, I'm, again, I'm only sharing them what's available for you to choose. And again, I mentioned Nicola and Mark on the from the um, 
teaching um, team that from the team, the maths teams, uh, that you can then contact them directly using the teaching maths at pearson.com or, or call if you'd like. They're quite good at responding. Um, the again for anyone for the teaching hub if you if you email your local representative they can give you more but this also available on the on the website the modular one separate is different so again you look out for those resources for that one as well at this point i'm going to stop talking and then i'm going to uh, stay in the background for a few minutes um this will conclude our uh, to receive any questions. This will conclude the module one. As I said, this was more informative. The second one has a lot more interaction and exploring and solving questions and doing some maths together as well. So please, if you'd like to print the, the delegates booklet, the second one will be sent out to you as well. Before the, the next module for the international GCC is on Wednesday. So if you can attend, that'll be great. And at the end of that one, and uh, there will be certificates sent out for attending the sessions. But as well as, as I said, for us to do the interactive activities, I do recommend you print out that or have a device where you can write or a sheet so that you can. I will try and display as many of the activities on the screen, but it's hard to put everything on one slide. So it might be at least you have a, you have a separate device there or you can have it loaded so that you can have it on and off to ask. So at this point, I'll stay in the background for a few more minutes. Um, to ask any answer any questions I'll be looking at the chat as well thank you for joining us I've noticed there were different people from different areas as well um, and I look forward to seeing you in the second session I'll be in the background to ask, ask answering any questions that you might have if you don't have any questions at this point you feel free to uh, log off thank you again for joining us and have a great day um, wherever you are <laughs>